Hello everybody and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about sickle cell anemia. And this is a very complicated disease that we could spend hours talking about, that entire books could be written about. But our goal today is to focus on the key teaching points that can not only be easily tested, but also found useful in a clinical setting. And we're going to break this up into three parts. In the first part, we're going to stay at the molecular level, discussing some of the biochemistry, pathophysiology, get a really good understanding before we move on to the second part, where we discuss the signs and symptoms of the disease. And in the third part, we're going to wrap it up with some common labs that are ordered and treatments that are available. And I want to go ahead and apologize in advance for the poor handwriting that I have and the elementary school level drawings I'm going to be using. Hopefully that means you can jot things down as I do and, and keep up. So let's go ahead and get started. So I think a good place to start is the definition of sickle cell anemia, which is that it is a hereditary blood disorder where mutations in the protein hemoglobin result in misshapen red blood cells that can cause whole body systemic complications. That's a lot of information in one sentence, so let's break it down. We're talking about a blood disorder here, so we had better understand the red blood cell. And the red blood cell, as we know, is what carries oxygen to the vital organs and tissues of the body. And the way it's able to do this is each red blood cell contains a protein called hemoglobin. And that's the oxygen binding component of the red blood cell that binds oxygen in the lungs and then carries it to the tissues and organs of the body. But if you think about it, the red blood cell has quite a task ahead of it. It has to travel a very intricate highway of um, arteries and capillaries throughout the body of varying sizes and shapes. And so to be able to do this, the red blood cell has to be very flexible. And luckily, it has a unique shape known as a biconcave disc, which affords it exactly that flexibility that it needs to perform its function. And we're going to see how that shape is compromised in sickle cell anemia and how that's so crucial to understanding the pathophysiology of the disease. So let's talk for a moment a little bit more about hemoglobin. That's the oxygen binding component of the red blood cell, as we said. But hemoglobin can come in a variety of flavors. In most of us, we have hemoglobin A, and this is a four-part protein that's made up of two alpha chains and two beta chains. Now, what happens in sickle cell anemia is that beta chain, that beta chain of the hemoglobin protein has a mutation in it. Specifically, at the sixth amino acid, the uh, amino acid glutamic acid is converted to the amino acid valine. And you might be saying to yourself just now, big deal, one amino acid, what, you know, how could that have such an important effect? Well, I assure you that that one amino acid change changes the entire biochemistry and pathophysiology of hemoglobin, and we're going to discuss that in just a second. And we're just going to draw here what the hemoglobin looks like. It's again two alpha chains, but now it's got these two mutated beta chains. And I just want to mention it here because we're talking about hemoglobin, but there's also something called hemoglobin F that's made up of two alpha chains and two gamma chains. And the things to remember about hemoglobin F are that it's found in newborns. It's found in all of us when we're born, and it lasts about six months before it's converted to hemoglobin A. Also, it has an increased affinity for oxygen, meaning that it binds oxygen tighter than hemoglobin A. And we're just going to mention the name now and we'll get to it later in the third part when we talk about treatments, but the drug hydroxyurea actually increases levels of hemoglobin F, and we'll see why that's important later on. Now, talking a little bit more about hemoglobin S, I mentioned that that one amino acid change completely changes how it reacts. Well, under certain situations such as hypoxia, dehydration, acidosis, infection, and cold, Whereas hemoglobin A is largely unaffected by these things, hemoglobin S will form a rope-like fiber and align with other fibers or polymerize. And what that's going to do is it's going to change the shape of the red blood cell from that nice, flexible, concave disc shape into a rigid crescent shape. And the consequences of this is that because it's so rigid and fragile, it's going to get stuck and they're going to stick together in some of those smaller vessels, smaller capillary beds, and that's going to ultimately block blood flow. And we'll see how that plays such an important role in the signs and symptoms a bit later. Now, we should discuss the epidemiology of this disease uh, briefly and who it affects. One out of every 500 African-American births has both 
beta chains mutated with the, with the mutation we talked about and are born with sickle cell disease. And that's a huge disease burden on this population. And it's thought that one of the reasons that they have such a high disease burden of this um, of sickle cell anemia is that sickle cell anemia is actually protective against malaria. And the reason that is is because malaria is a protozoan that infects humans, and part of its life cycle involves replicating in red blood cells. So instead of having those nice biconcave discs to replicate in, if they have to replicate in these sickled cells that are more fragile, not as effective, it's not going to be the ideal environment for it to replicate. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology briefly. Um, and I think this is one of the most exciting parts about learning this disease because all the signs and symptoms that we're going to talk about in part two, you can really derive from these two pathophysiologic processes, hemolysis and vasoocclusive phenomenon. Let's discuss each of them in detail. When we talk about hemolysis, we're talking about lysis of red blood cells. And this can happen in two ways, intravascularly or extravascularly. Let's discuss each of those in detail. When we say intravascular hemolysis, we mean that this fragile red blood cell now that is sickled is prone to breaking apart inside of the blood vessel. And it's going to release its contents, one of which we know is hemoglobin. Now what happens is in the blood, there is also another protein called haptoglobin waiting around for exactly this purpose. If hemoglobin is found, haptoglobin will bind it and it will take it to be removed from the body. Now extravascular hemolysis is a little bit more involved. It's extravascular, not in the vessels. It's happening actually more in the spleen. And what happens is in the spleen, there are splenic macrophages that are going to eat the hemoglobin that is released from the red blood cells, and it's going to break it down into its constituent parts. And unsurprisingly, hemoglobin is broken down into globin and heme. The globin is broken down further into amino acids, while the heme is broken down into iron and biliverdin. Now the biliverdin is converted into bilirubin, and at this point we're going to call it unconjugated bilirubin. Now this is picked up by the protein albumin, transported into the blood, and then transported to the liver, where an enzyme exists called UGT, and it's going to convert that unconjugated bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin. And that's going to go off into the gallbladder or to the intestines to be excreted. Now what's important here for us to understand, though, is that in sickle cell anemia, this whole process of hemolysis is increased. So there's going to be more hemoglobin released, which means there's more heme, which means there's more biliverdin, sorry, and more bilirubin. And ultimately, this enzyme here gets overwhelmed with all these increases, and we, we end up stacking up here. This unconjugated bilirubin builds up and has two very important consequences, gallstones and causing jaundice or yellowing of the skin. And we'll mention this again later in the signs and symptoms. Now, the thing to remember, though, is regardless of if it's intravascular or extravascular hemolysis, hemolysis of any kind is going to lead to decreased red blood cells. And again, we'll see how that plays into the signs and symptoms. When we talk about vasoocclusive phenomenon, we already mentioned how the sickled red blood cells are less flexible, more sticky. And in those smaller vessels, they're going to block off blood flow. And that's going to have whole body systemic effects. And we're going to discuss that in the next section of signs and symptoms.